Hi, I'm Dr. Jake Bretherick, and if you're new, I'm a mythologist, folklorist, and overall esotericist with a focus in modern witchcraft and neo-pagan practices. And I'm here to answer the top 10 most searched questions about witchcraft. Let's get started. Number one, what is the historical origin of the witch concept? That's a loaded question, but there have always been magical practitioners um, very far back into history, thousands and thousands of years. And there's always been people who utilize magic for the benefit of the greater whole. And there have always been people who use it for the benefit of the individual. And that can sometimes be seen as a negative. And in some cases is <laughs> arguably based on where you are in your philosophical journey. Uh, but as for the term witch itself and what we would call a witch, uh, that word comes to us from the early mid middle ages, which is going to be around, uh, five, the fifth to the 10th century. And it comes the word, witch, even from a word, uh, that you've heard, certainly if you've read the work of Gerald Gardner, and that is witte or wiki or witzy, uh, which is like Wicca with an E, right? At the end. And that as a whole would have been like something like Wikikreft or Wittekreft, something like that. And that was a word that was used to denote malicious, negative um, practitioners of magic and Satanists more so. Uh, people that were betraying their oaths to the church, which is also where we get the evolution of the word warlock um, as a variant to the word witch that's mostly for the male practitioner. It simply means someone who has broken their oath to uh, God and the church and has joined the ranks of Satan. It wasn't until probably, I'm going to say, the late 19th century that we start seeing the word witch used in a more positive tone occasionally in fairy tales. And it's not until really the late 1960s that Western Europe into America, we start seeing the word witch reclaimed by individuals as something completely positive and divorced from its negative uh, beginnings. Let's see, question two. Why are witches evil? <laughs> well, uh, are they? <laughs> are they? If you mean like um, historically, the word witch is always used to, you know, denote someone who is evil. Again, as we said before, this is someone who has divorced themselves from the teachings of Christ and has outcast themselves from the community, usually by... Uh, embracing the teachings of Satan. Now, most of that is propaganda. We know that uh, there weren't really individuals practicing uh, witchcraft in that sense in recorded history, uh, like at all. There were, however, people that did hold on for a very long time into the Middle Ages, the early Middle Ages. They did hold on to those pagan beliefs and practices that were becoming either absorbed by the Catholic Church or demonized by the Catholic Church. And certainly those individuals who were uh, continuing their traditions that had been demonized by the Catholic Church would have had an immense pressure on them to either cease those practices or practice them in secret. And that would certainly earn someone the witch label. What is a coven? Okay, a coven is, of course, a group of magical practitioners, usually witches, but not always. It can be used as a name for all kinds of magical practitioners. But that word does not really get uh, widespread use until after 1921 with a book uh, published by Margaret Murray called The Witch Cult in Western Europe. That is when the term coven and the idea that there are 13 members to a coven and more so of what we see now as a coven, what you think of, that really came from that. Before that, um, certainly there was an idea going back again to the early Middle Ages uh, that witches did gather in groups and practice like dark Sabbath rituals. 
But more often than not, the witch was alone. The witch was a singular person who practiced by themselves in the most secret, dark places away from prying eyes. And the best way to continue to do your work as a witch, right, in that sense, would to not be, you know, associated with a lot of people. You wouldn't tell a lot of people that you're practicing witchcraft or that you were doing it, and you certainly do it in a group because then you would be more easily caught, right? Isn't that the idea? Uh, number four, what is a familiar and why are they usually gross animals? Wow. Um, if by gross animals you mean like, you know, snakes and frogs and rats and spiders and all manner of bugs that are usually attributed to, uh, particularly women in, uh, the colonial period as being their familiars, then okay. Uh, but, you know, all manner of animals throughout history have been attributed as being familiars. I mean, really, almost anything you can think of. Fish, cattle, uh, chickens, uh, dogs, cats, of course. And, of course, most popularly, it would be animals with some kind of defect or affectation, uh, like black fur, um, red-tipped ears, or white feet. Um, all manner of anything peculiar and out of the ordinary on an animal would may be classified as a familiar. And we do have records of them executing animals because they believed that they were either witches familiars, which would make them harbingers for Satan and the dark forces, or they were executed because it was believed that that was a witch transformed into an animal uh, vessel, right? Uh, but it, as for just gross animals, it can be all kinds of animals. And what is the reason that a witch is associated with familiars in the first place? Because we certainly don't really see it in Christianity in, um, of the time period. Well, there's a couple of thoughts. So a familiar itself is a word that, uh, just means like, you know, a close friend or a companion, right? And you do see that in society, particularly high society of the time, that word being used. So it's not just a word used just for uh, witches. And, you know, it could have come from animal husbandry and animal domestication. Certainly in the beginnings of um, humanity and more civilized societies, you know, the idea of taming animals... Um, breeding animals, that was a special skill and could be seen as something really miraculous to be able to do. And so certainly people who in early, especially Viking cultures comes to mind, um, people who had, you know, that talent and to work with animals in that way would have been protected by the community. But we could see in later times how someone who maybe spends more time with animals than with the persons might be seen as strange or an outsider and that is a threat to the community right um you know i do have to say that i do also think of like the the eve snake comparison right because christianity um really gave us the word witch and the idea of what a witch is um you have to i think think of you know eve with a snake right so much of witchcraft is geared towards devaluing women and that starts with the bible that starts in the first book of genesis where we we degrade and subjugate the woman with eve and eve was tempted by this snake who was satan in disguise right so again you see how this parallels to witches and how they would work with animals to tempt other people um, I think that's an interesting parallel to make that certainly I think that the idea of a traditional familiar in, con in contemporary England at the time uh, certainly could be influenced by the book of Genesis. Question number five, how are spells and potions created? Um, spells and potions are create the actual act of creating a potion um, is done, you know as you would think with a cauldron or in modern times, it could be done on a stove or a microwave. It's with some kind of heating device and liquid, right? It's important to, to note that potions were learned through trial and error. They were 
really scientific and most of the potion information and elixirs and tonics and all those fun words that we have come from really what we would call not witches but alchemists and in some cases sorcerers these were almost always men of science who were working for a higher government in a government position under the king um as in some form of aid or a healer um for the royal family and addition trial and error and through the scientific method potions were also learned from family members passed on like herbal knowledge they were also learned especially in shamanism through spirit communication this would be ideas and formulas that would come to you in an altered state of consciousness from the other world um, and that applies to spells and potion formulas. Let's see. Question number six. Can men be witches? That is always a question that seems to come up. And of course, men can be witches. Men have always been associated with witches. Uh, going back to the Salem witch trials specifically, we can see that there were a few men tried as witches, sometimes under the word warlock, sometimes under the word witch. And also, again, Going back to, you know, the rise of the patriarchy and the subjugation of women under the Catholic Church, we see that even those men who are tried as witches, more often than not in our surviving records, are accused because of their close proximity to a woman that was accused of witchcraft. So, but in modern um, usage, of course, men can be witches, although we don't really see that being used as a term by men within the magical communities until really the mid to late 80s, particularly after the rise of very popular authors like Scott Cunningham, who really pushed the idea that men can be witches and call themselves witches. Before that, Going back to Gerald Gardner, there was the idea that if you were a magical practitioner, particularly under his vision of Wicca, you were called a Wiki or um, a Wicca, a Wiccan, or a Wiccan with an E or an A to denote gender. Question seven, what are different types of magic? Again, that is a loaded question. Magic in and itself has a huge asterisk after it. Magic to some people is not magic to other people. Some cultures don't even believe in magic, but believe in things that other cultures and maybe you, the individual, would call magic. So with that out of the way, there are all types, uh, all kinds of types of magic. There is high magic and low magic, which would be magic that's more complex. Low magic, which is a little more quick and easy without ritual. There's also, you know, light magic and dark magic, which would be magic uh, for positive gain, magic for, you know, negative pursuits. Um, there's, you know, different traditions that hone their own magical systems, right? Uh, shamanism, hoodoo, witchcraft. There's many, many, many kinds. Even superstitions, something as simple as superstitions. Uh, as a collective group of ideas can be called magic by different traditions. And again, magic can be good, it can be bad. It depends on the overarching culture, on what they deem good magic or bad magic, if any good at all. Uh, but we see magical practices, what we would call magical practices or folk practices, sometimes is used to lessen the idea of magic. Uh, all the way up to the present day it's evident all through american history uh the puritans as uh as uh what's what's a what's a good not negative word uh the puritans as devout as they were still practiced things that even modern christians today would denounce as magical practices such as their use of sigils and uh their long-held superstitions linked to agriculture and the moon question number eight how were the witches in trials killed immediate answer burned at the stake right that's what most people believe and it is true some witches were burned at the stake mostly in uh france but 
more often than not, the world over, witches almost were never burned alive at the stake. Most witches were hanged, uh, including in America. There are no recordings of a witch ever being burned at the stake in America, in colonial uh, England, right? New England. More often than not, they were hung. Some witches were drowned. And in the instance of oh, one guy in particular, he was pressed to death with stones laid on top of his body. There were all sorts of creative ways to rid a community of the witch menace, but it almost never included fire. Question number nine, the difference in Wicca and traditional witchcraft. Well, if we're talking about traditional witchcraft as a word to denote, again, witchcraft before the 1800s, we'll say, going back to the early Middle Ages, there are massive differences between Wicca and witchcraft as told to us by the Catholic Church at that time. As we've spoken about before, witchcraft was not witchcraft as we see it today, as a more like pagan adjacent or pagan spirituality that reveres the earth and the ancestors. Um, this witchcraft was more of a Luciferian, satanic, opposing force to Christianity. So when we label witchcraft in that way versus Wicca, they are completely opposite and share almost no similarities. Now, if we are saying Wicca versus traditional witchcraft as the name of a specific tradition of witchcraft that's very popular at the time of this recording, there are still major differences. Wicca has its own dogma, has its own set of uh, suggested rules and code of conduct. However, in traditional witchcraft and witchcraft at large, it's much more gray. It's much more up to the individual or to the coven on how they want to conduct themselves on the type of magic they want to practice and on whether they believe in and, and work with any manner of entities and deities. Question answered. <laughs> and question 10. What is up with the witch hat? Why it so pointy? <laughs> the conical hat, easy answer, we don't know where it really comes from, but we don't really see witches drawn in uh, fiction um, or in uh, Christian uh, texts with pointy hats until much, much later. And it's like way later. like. 1800s so uh, and on so the idea is that maybe it comes from some people have said the quakers right because the quakers wore a very specific hat although it was not really pointy there are some groups that did wear somewhat of a pointy hat uh some ethnicities um but nothing like what you see the, the, the conical hat that we see is an exaggeration of possibly and probably uh, headwear worn by all manner of religious and ethnic groups that were coming into America at the time of this great immigration wave. Uh, the witch kind of took on this xenophobic um, image at that time. So you see all kinds of influences being thrown into the witch from the white Anglican person, including not just foreign headwear, but foreign wear and foreign mannerisms are being attributed to the witch. Uh, we see, you know, of course, again, going back to like the idea of familiar, we see, this is when we start seeing witches really being pushed as people who look different, act different, think different. So there you go. Those are the top 10 questions posed by the internet about witchcraft, according to Google. And I hope you learned a little something something, and I hope you enjoyed it. And until next time, goodbye.